So Rob Hopkins, it's a delight to get a chance to talk to you today. You combine a couple of my own passions and interests in climate and in meditation, contemplation, and you've, you're much more deeply involved with them <laughs> than I am. So I'm really excited to hear some of your wisdom today. Thank you. So pleasure to be here. Great. So could you start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your, your background in contemplation and how you started the transition movement? Yeah, sure. So I'm Rob. I live in a town called Totnes in Devon. I guess my first experience with contemplation and stuff was when I was about 15, 16. I lived in Bristol. I was living in my aunt's house, slightly bewildered, angry, a teenager who listened to lots of loud records, was very into punk and things at that time. And my aunt's house was the Bristol Buddhist Centre at the time and I was really like oh god I can't stand all this stuff <laughs> you know lamas coming around to give teachings and I'd be like yeah. stropping up and down the stairs so it's not the ideal thing to have in a buddhist center really so through that I met a guy called Dan who was the son of somebody who was very involved in the buddhist center would come down to visit and I would take him out and introduce him to people that I knew and stuff and then a couple of years later him, him and I shared a flat he was very involved in, in Buddhism. And then we had a kind of a competition with each other to see who could get out of England and stay out of England. We were very disaffected and we'd had enough and we wanted to find ways that we could stay outside of England. So we both bought interrail tickets. We went off in different directions. I ended up coming back, couldn't find any way to stay away. He went to Italy to a place called Istituto Lama San Carpa, which is a big Buddhist center there in Tuscany, and would send me postcards saying, oh, it's fantastic, I know it's really nice, and I'm having a great time. So the next summer, after a year of doing really terrible jobs, I went out to go and see him. And I wasn't interested in Buddhism. I still had a bit of my kind of baggage from stropping up and down my aunt's stairs when it was full of Buddhists. But I was interested in learning to meditate. So I went there and I loved it. It was the most beautiful place. It was very friendly. And at the time, the way it worked was that if you worked, then your work covered your stay there. So I thought, this is amazing. I've hit the jackpot. I can stay out of England. I can be in Tuscany and I can learn to meditate. This is amazing. And I always tell the story that when I arrived there, it's like it's a big place. It's like a, it can sleep like 140 people size sort of hotel sort of thing. They said, uh, OK, you're going to work with Alessandro. He's the house manager and you're going to help with all the cleaning and the rooms and everything. Great. OK, so he shows me the ropes. After about three weeks, he says, uh, right, I'm off to Elba now to work the summer season. Well, I said, oh, who takes over after you? You do. Here are the keys. <laughs> so I'm like 18, just arrived. Oh, and there's 100 people coming for a course on Thursday. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? But it was one of the best things ever happened to me. I was there for two and a half years. It was like my life university. It was just amazing. It was at a time when all of a lot of those extraordinary lamas who left Tibet in 1959 were still alive and came there to teach. Yeah, and I took refuge there and I went to some extraordinary teachings with some phenomenal teachers. After two and a half years, I went to India and worked at the Enlightenment Experience Celebration there for six months. Mm. And then my big mission was to go to Mount Kailash. And I set off on this journey to try and get to Mount Kailash through Pakistan and through China, which ended with my being arrested by Chinese police 10 miles north of Lhasa because I didn't have a visa. But I have gone all the way around Mount Kailash, just at a very wide distance. So I feel like I got something out of that. I met my wife there in Dharamsala, and we've been together ever since. And so then we started having a family, and that was my kind of crash course in it all. And then the transition movement came around in about 2005, 2006. I'd been a permaculture teacher for a long time. Permaculture arrived in my life when I was about 22, 23, and it rewired my brain as this sort of extraordinary toolkit for putting the world back together again. It was literally, I, I came back from India, I arrived back in the UK, and I met a friend of mine I hadn't seen for a while who said, I think you might enjoy this, and gave me a copy of Bill Mollison's big permaculture designer's manual, mm -hmm. and I opened it onto this term earth repair, this concept of earth repair, mm -hmm. that someone had written a book about how taking the best learnings from traditional agriculture systems, indigenous practice, and so on, how to put everything back together again. And I thought, this is phenomenal. So I then dedicated my life to learning as much about that as I could. 
and to implementing it. And then the transition movement came around because I'd had my kind of climate change, dark night of the soul, I guess, in around 2004. And I'd been very involved with permaculture for a long time. I'd lived in Ireland. I'd set up the first two-year full-time permaculture course in the world, I think, at that point. But I felt like the permaculture movement had this idea that it wanted to change the world, but it also didn't really want to interact with the world very much. It was very much in a kind of an alternative culture sort of place Mm -hmm. and wanted to change the mainstream, but really didn't want to engage with it. So transition for me was the idea of how you might take those principles but get communities working with them and i'm sure we'll talk about it more but basically in a nutshell we we started it here 2005 2006 it took off all over the place and you can now find transition groups in 50 countries around the world in thousands of different places and my role is really that of supporting that movement collecting its stories and telling them in lots of different ways and you're still there right in totness devon i'm still here I'm still yeah. here. I love it. So that area is a kind of hotbed for this deep ecology movement where there's you know, these communities and education activism. Can you talk about these steps? Because it seems like those three aspects are really important for your work. How do you go from activism to community to education and how Transition Network fits into that arc? So I guess for me, going back to Buddhism, one mm-hmm. of the things that that I missed out talking about mm-hmm. was when I was about 18, the first book I read when I arrived in Italy was Chogam Trumpa's Shambhala, The Way of the Warrior. Mm-hmm. And it had a massive effect on me, that book. I guess before I had always thought that spiritual practice was something a bit flaky and a bit woolly and something mm-hmm. that people did to get away from realities in my very judgmental kind of teenage mind you know and actually that book said no you need to live your life as a warrior with bodhicitta as your shield and your tools in the world and so so from pretty much from that point forward that bodhisattva notion that you live your life as a life of service to other people profoundly shaped what i do and how i do it So for me, my activism is an expression of that spirit and that commitment that it's not about me. It's about what is needed at the moment Mm. and to bring whatever skills and insight I can to that. So for me, it's about the active activism, what was ed- community and education. Yeah. So community, because of course we need international action. Uh, we need stuff that national governments do acting as if it's a climate emergency, ecological emergency, social justice emergency. We need local governments. We need business. We need all the things we do as individuals. But the thing that always underpinned my work and my thinking was that there's a bit that's missing from that which is the community piece Mm. which is what can we do with the people on our street in our neighborhood if we come together and we work together what could we create and I now know having visited hundreds and hundreds of transition communities across Europe I don't fly so that's as far as Mm. my range extends that communities working together can do extraordinary things and are a really vital piece of of the equation. Even 20 people in a community working together can create like a community energy company that can then raise millions of pounds in community investment to unlock all sorts of renewable energy infrastructure. They can create community farms. They can reimagine a city's mm-hmm. food system. They can do extraordinary stuff. So there's a beautiful quote about the, by Thich Nhat Hanh that says something like, maybe the next Buddha will come back as a community or something like that. It's a really (laughs) lovely quote. So in the transition movement, it's very much about an expression of activism, not the only expression of activism, because we also need the kind of activism we see with Extinction Rebellion and and organisations like that. And certainly for my wife, who was, we've very much shared a path into Buddhism and then through Mm -hmm. working with that. Extinction Rebellion is very much her expression of compassionate mm. action non-violent direct bodhisattva practice is extinction rebellion and mine is much more transition 
and working as a community, working with mm -hmm. communities, working to build community around the things that we create. And education is a, is a fundamental part of that. Would you have maybe one specific story you could share about a success, you know, however small? Yeah, I mean, there's loads and loads. So, you know, I could spend, we could do a 20 hour long podcast. I could just I'm tell sure, story yeah. after story. Yeah. No, I, one of my favorite ones that I always tell all the time is from Belgium in Liège, which is a big yeah. old industrial city. Not that remarkable as cities go, but about nine years ago, they formed Liège en Transition as a transition group for the city. And in their food group, they came up with a really great what if question. So they said, what yeah. if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in Liège came from the land closest to Liège. This idea of what they called a food belt. So I went there to meet them at the very early stage and they did a big public event where they launched this idea around this what if question and they invited everybody in the city who cared about food, academics, politicians, baristas, I don't know, chefs, everybody did this really great launch event. And then I didn't hear anything very much for four or five years. And then I went back in 2018. And in that time in Liège, they'd started 27 new cooperatives and they raised 5 million euros of investment, not from the bank, but from the people of Liège investing in those co-ops. And for me, it was really emotional, actually, as someone who spent 12, 13 years with this kind of vision in my head of how a low carbon future could be more local, more resilient, more diverse, more, you know, connected to place. And there it is in Liège and I'm having my lunch in it and meeting people employed in it and going to the shops and visiting the brewery and visiting the vineyard and the farm and just getting a sense of this is possible. This is just extraordinary. And it's now the vehicle that's being used by the municipality in Liège to reimagine how they procure food for the hospitals, the schools, the universities. I met the mayor of Liège who said, this is now the story of our city. We used to say we wanted to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. It's a model that's spreading to other cities in Belgium. It's just phenomenal. And it has a beautiful culture of just saying yes to everything. Uh, yeah, that's one example. But, the, you know, the beauty of it is that there are big, really ambitious stories like that. And then there's just the really simple stories about the community who made a little garden on their street or the community who just started planting trees at their local school and what that then led to. That's the thing I love most is I always say to people that moment when you are in a meeting with other people and you come up with an idea and that moment when you say, so should we do it then? Yeah, let's do it. But you never know what that moment can lead to and what it can unlock and what its potential is. Yeah. That phrase, what if, is in the title of one of your books, From What Is to What If. And you talk about how we live in a time when we're linking, when we're lacking how things turn out okay <laughs> stories, yeah. which uh, it's hard to disagree with that statement. But then when you look at the climate crisis, you know, in some ways worse than ever, you know, undeniable, absolutely true, the, the implications that we're probably going to live with for a few hundred years. Can you talk about to rewind from action just to stories? Why do we need positive stories? What's the power yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, When I go to Belgium and France, there's a movement there called Collapsologie, which is this sort of collapsologist movement. That, and it is now inevitable that everything is going to collapse. And the best you can do is just prepare for that and get used to the fact. And I feel on some level, if we carry on as we are, they may well be right. And actually, in some ways, I think there is value to that. It's like the first noble truth. There is suffering. Mm -hmm and things are impermanent. And for people who still imagine that the world in the 21st century is some kind of permanent, well-functioning thing with no fragilities, then it's quite mm -hmm. a useful thing. Although it can also be massively, I think, kind of disempowering. And I see, I've seen a lot of people who've got into it and it's just taken all of their, all the joy out of everything. You know, Joanna Macy is somebody who I have a huge amount of love and, and, and affection mm -hmm. for. She's phenomenal uh, and an incredible Buddhist scholar as well. And she does these very powerful activities where you sit in a pair with somebody, and you take it in turns saying, when I think of the ecological collapse, I feel. And it's about going into that grief. And she calls it despair and empowerment work. And it's, she's, it's amazing. And I've done a few things with her in the past. And I, I think she's one of the great, bodhisattvas of our time really in her practice she's amazing 
but I saw a video of her doing it recently, and she, she asked something like three questions. When I think about the collapse of civilization, I feel. When I think about the inevitability of climate change, I feel. And there's something else like that. And I thought, where's the one that says, when I think about being part of the most astonishing global movement in history that turned this around, I feel. Mm. Because I worry that if you read, like Paul Hawken just wrote a book called How to Fix the Climate Crisis in a Generation, which I haven't got yet, but I'm looking forward mm. to. And he wrote a book called Drawdown before that basically pulled together everything that we know already exists. We're not waiting for some silver bullet to be invented. Mm -hmm. We know this works. We know this works. We know this works. Mm -hmm. If we just got on with it and did it all with incredible focus and urgency, where would it get us to? I think that we shut that down so mm -hmm. often with these narratives about it being too late. And I, one of my loves in my life is, is football. And, and I've <laughs> seen enough games where a team is losing 3-0 at half time, which is basically what we are at the moment but who came out on 1-5-3. And I have no idea how they did it, but I know at halftime the manager didn't say, well, it's probably too late, isn't it? There's not really much point in trying. And I think we've had it. So for me, in terms of stories, often we either have the dystopian stories, which we love dystopian stories. We make endless films about them where humanity mm -hmm. is wiped out by diseases or aliens or robots or gremlins or god knows what wiping out we love that stuff we have a lot less but still a good tradition of of utopian stories mm -hmm. people telling stories about you know everything turning out amazing and fantastic what we don't have is is what rupert reed calls through topias which mm -hmm. is the stories that start now and point away through the next 10 years and bring it alive and we were talking before we started recording about kim stanley robinson's ministry for the future book which i think is a really brave attempt at doing that but we need so many of those stories and actually at the moment i'm reading a lot of stuff around black utopian like the, mm. i think a lot of black writers and black culture actually have been better at that because they've had to be because they've been in the most appalling places and had to try and figure out how how do we get out of here and what would it be like when we get out of here it's one of the things that i think we need a lot more of and so i in the work that i do i try to collect stories like the story of liege mm. which are stories about ordinary people just starting things mm. and where they go and sometimes they don't work and sometimes they work in ways that nobody could have predicted and sometimes they're completely taken by surprise about the direction in which things go so so i i feel like this idea of writing through topia is absolutely vital really i don't want to put you on the spot but could you share a through topia is there a relatively brief plausible positive story about our future you could share with us I think if anybody were to pick up the, so From What Is to What If, which is the book I wrote about mm -hmm. imagination, it starts with a kind of six page storytelling from 2030. Mm -hmm. And actually what I try and do in the podcast that I do, which is called From What If to What Next, is that every episode uh, I ask my guests to step into my time machine. I always use this imaginary time machine in lots of talks and workshops that I do to imagine that they're traveling to a 2030 that's not utopia, but it's the result of us doing everything we could have done so that those nine years between now and then felt like living through a revolution of the imagination, which felt unimaginable in 2021, but it built and built and built. And to the point where the 2030 that we get to feels like in many ways, it looks the same, but it has really changed. And I can maybe read a few little bits of those. Out oh, sure. People yeah. say. So we now use re a lot more in our language, rebuilding, refurbishing, remaking, reusing, recreating, reinventing. The re is now a big part of our language. Uh, financial insecurity has been eradicated. People no longer go to work because they had to. All those workspaces that used to be occupied by big banks are now redirected and used for creative purposes of all sorts, whether it's technical or artistry. When you see girlfriends meet each other, they don't say, I see you've got a new dress. They say, oh, well, you've got the same dress you had last week, but you've made a little change to it. And that's so fancy and so fashionable. And this city really changed since the Ministry of Imagination opened in 2022. This city has become a huge laboratory in which everyone can participate. You hear laughter, not just of children, but of adults. The place is alive with activity. There are people everywhere doing things. 
People walk freely in their bodies, regardless of their shape, their size, their abilities, their gender expression, the color of their skins, their age, and as an embrace of that, it smells like growing things. And the air is filled with birdsong again, and the city looks much more like a rich parkland or forest, and all the city's children have access to good food. So, so what I do is, is I do a lot of, I invite people, whether it's in a small workshop or I've done this with 1500 people in a hall in Brussels to imagine that they travel to that future. That's not utopia. It's not paradise, but it's the result of us doing everything we could. And then to take a walk around and to imagine what it's like, and then to describe it to somebody else. And then to think, what were the what if questions that people asked in 2021 that unlocked this to go back and say, how did we get here? What did we start doing in 2021? So for me, the telling of a through topia has to start by stepping a bit into the future and then looking back and then starting to tell the stories about how we got this process rolling and uh, and what it led to. What would you say to people that say, if we're too optimistic, <laughs> it might reduce the urgency we feel towards these issues? I think anybody who goes around being giddily optimistic all the time <laughs> is really not paying attention and is probably in an enormous amount of denial. At the same time as anyone who spends all of their time feeling completely pessimistic is also missing out on a huge amount. I think Paul Hawken put it really beautifully. He said, if you read the climate science and you're not a pessimist, you haven't read it properly, go back and read it again. But if you've spent any time among the movements around the world that are trying to do something about it and you don't feel optimistic, then you don't have a heart. When the last IPCC report came out, I had a very difficult few days, I think, reading that. And Aldo Leopold, who was one of the first sort of people we might think of as an environmentalist, he once said, to live in a world with an ecological understanding is to live in a world of wounds. It's why Joanna Macy does so much work around grief and despair and empowerment, because it's really very, very painful. And particularly Mm -hmm. when you see the levels of inaction and the people Mm -hmm. who are still vigorously pushing us in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very hard. I guess I've, for me, I feel like there's a, there's maybe like a healthy cycle mm-hmm. where grief and despair are at the bottom and really engaged purposeful action at the top. And we naturally cycle. It's not that we stay there all the time, but it's that we can move from one to the other and not get stuck. And what I find is that grounding that in doing something Mm-hmm. makes a big difference the thing that is guaranteed to make people feel really pessimistic is just sitting by and watching and i know so many people who've got involved in projects and mm-hmm. got involved in their community and trying to imagine a different future and that's what has mm-hmm. been their route back to thinking maybe this is possible mm, that's great Another thing you talk about is how um, there's evidence that things can change rapidly (laughs) in society. It reminds me of a story. I'm a big fan of the Long Now Foundation. So there's a story I learned from there that in New York City, there was a panic in the horse and buggy era because they were projecting the horse poop (laughs) (laughs) um, levels. They looked at the projections and the growth of horse and buggies and they said, there's going to be six feet of horse poop on the streets in 10 years. What are we going to do? And then, of course, the automobile was invented, which <laughs> in hindsight brought its own problems. It's its own right? problems, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. In fact, the one <laughs> we're talking about. And then it's also the current COVID-19 situation, maybe. I think before this, the average time to create a vaccine was 20 years or something like that. And all of a sudden, we made one in, in nine months. So can you talk a little bit about that, of you know how fast and rapidly we can change? Yeah, I I feel like Naomi Klein puts it really beautifully. She Mm -hmm. said, there are no non-radical solutions left. And I feel one of the things, politics in the last 10 or 20 years has really settled on this idea that change can only happen in small little incremental steps. And COVID showed that was the myth that it always was. We saw companies that make engines for Formula One racing cars switching over to making ventilators in a matter of weeks. We saw craft breweries repurpose, so they were making hand sanitizer. We saw the idea that you can only run a successful business if you fly all of your media team to Paris for a breakfast meeting once a month as the total nonsense that that, Mm -hmm. that it always was. I did a talk a little while ago where we were talking about this, and I said, I think there's we're talking about what if questions. There's a few kind of what if questions for me that came out of COVID. You know, what if we could listen to scientists when they tell us something's an emergency? Mm. What if we could move in big steps 
what if industry could be repurposed in a surprisingly short amount of time? What if communities are amazing and can do incredible stuff and could do even more incredible stuff if they were supported properly? What if we learned to value the work that was actually valuable? What if we could work from home? And what would that mean for commuting and pollution? What if we could cut aviation by 90% in a year and actually things pretty much continued to function? What if money was never the issue? What if we had a universal basic income, which in the UK we almost had during COVID? What if uh, we actually reimagined education so that education happened outside and we used our cities and towns as classrooms? What if schools taught kids to enjoy time to themselves and to not get bored? I, I feel like the first lockdown was an incredible thing because it gave people space. The imagination needs space and time, which it never has. And we all dash around in this kind of imagine, vacuum of the imagination with no time to do anything. And we saw that time where people started writing the novel they always wanted to write and doing online art classes and posting their pictures everywhere and making dance videos with their whole family doing routines. And it was really quite extraordinary. I think what it showed us is that so many of the myths that change only moves really slowly were just rubbish and always were mm -hmm. rubbish and, and that we yeah that, that, that we can do things an awful lot better than that i think it also really was a reminder of impermanence mm -hmm. and like you say a, a reminder that scientists are incredible <laughs> <laughs> i think you you talked a little bit about the ideal of the bodhisattva you know as an engaged kind of spiritual warrior in the world, but you didn't talk about meditation. I wanted to ask a little bit about that because that idea of engaged Buddhism is actually a little more rare still. And it's nice to see you embodying that, but can you talk a little bit about the quiet meditation, the mm. quiet contemplation and what's that role? How does that relate in, in particular for yourself? How does that relate to your work with communities and climate? I think I'm a pretty terrible Buddhist, really. I had years when I did lots and lots of meditation and then uh -huh. I had kids. And then it, basically then that meant there was years where anytime I shut my eyes, I just fell asleep because <laughs> working <laughs> and having little kids and, you know, I'm reaching the stage in my life now where they're all growing up and leaving home and I really need to build back a kind of a contemplative, I've, like a meditation practice. And, and I remember when my first son, well, no, when my second son came going to see my teacher, in, in Italy and him saying your family is your practice and he was right because actually having young kids is the best patience generosity loving kindness practice mm. you could ever wish for I guess at the, at the moment because I'm also an artist and mm. for me my contemplative time at the moment tends to be more when I go drawing and I get into a totally different zone, just sitting and looking and really seeing. And it's one of the things that really I learned from doing the imagination book is about attention, that you can't have a really vigorous imagination if you don't also have, a, have an ability to concentrate and to focus your attention. And I find the erosion, or you could even say collapse, of our attention spans absolutely terrifying and I always tell the story of I ask people to imagine if they're in the yellow house in Arles in France in 1888 uh, in the kitchen and Vincent van Gogh comes in with a beautiful bunch of sunflowers and he arranges them in a little pot on the table as the sunlight comes in through the window and then he gets out his smartphone and thinks I'll just check my Twitter and my Facebook and my Instagram. And two hours later, he's watching skateboarding videos on YouTube. And he can't <laughs> even remember why he tried to start, why he started watching them. Then we wouldn't have the sunflowers paintings yeah. and, and how they've transformed everybody's lives. And, yeah. and I worry that as our collective attention span becomes more and more dispersed, we no longer, like, where do the great ideas come from? How many great mm -hmm. ideas for solving the climate crisis are we missing? Because our minds are just elsewhere most of the time. So for me, I, I feel like, like at this point in my life, my contemplation practice comes when I write. Mm -hmm. It comes when I draw. It comes when I walk my dog in the forest. And that's when all my best ideas come to me when I ride my bicycle. Mm -hmm. But I also know that 
meditation for me shaped me really i think in lots and lots of ways and retreats and all of that and was really made a huge difference so yeah maybe this maybe being on this <laughs> podcast is what will be the kick up the arse i need to actually get back to it again well you know one of my one of my teachers said you're more likely to find a bodhisattva at a football game than on a cushion <laughs> you know or in a retreat <laughs> game so i well, think you're embodying that ideal of if you really feel it so deeply in your heart and you have the skill which you obviously do then it's a better use of your time. <laughs> to be well, I guess what, what Greta Thunberg would say is if the house is on fire, maybe you need to get off the cushion and look for the fire extinguisher. I, when I lived in Italy and I was very committed to and very involved in the community there, learning all the sort of meditation practices about seeing the world as being a pure land and mm -hmm. like lapis lazuli and smooth as the mm -hmm. whatever. The thing. Yeah, um, pure, pure view. Yeah, but then you'd go around the back and all the bins were full of plastic and all the food came in from the supermarkets and people had showers for half an hour and <laughs> in a place with, with real water scarcity. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting. And then going to Dharamsala, where all the Tibetan community was living at the time and the waste piles everywhere and thinking, okay, there's something that's not quite joining up here. And so for me, my, my very original thing was I wanted to create, I wanted to do a sort of ecological Dharma sort of mm. practice, a center that brought all those things together, which didn't quite end up happening in that way. But I guess it's all, that's always been my drive is how do we, how do we do this stuff in the, in the real world? It has to be a lived practice, I think. Yeah, there's a term I recently learned called spiritual bypass. I don't know if you've, oh, yeah, I heard, you've that heard it, too, yeah. but it's, I think it really resonates a lot because it's this idea that you use your spirituality as a kind of denial, like everything's fine, whatever it is, it's not limited to Vajrayana Buddhism. <laughs> it can be any kind of, any form of spirituality. I was raised a Christian scientist, so that okay. was even more extreme. You don't go to a doctor, I'll be fine. <laughs> so what you're saying really resonates with me, I think. All of us who consider us of ourselves as spiritual practitioners, I think it's a very careful line to tread to somehow find that optimism and, and a vision, but be realistic, which like somehow I think you of all people embody that quite well. So it's, a, it's a really interesting to learn from your example of how to avoid spiritual bypass. I think it's one of the reasons as well why the transition movement and the transition model put such an emphasis on there's what we call outer transition and, and inner transition. You know, that actually the transition movement is not just about solar panels and organic carrots. It's about how we do the activism that we do mattering just as much as what we do and that we don't replicate the paradigm that we're trying to replace in the ways in which we try to get there so there's no point trying to replace the current system which is making such a massive mess of everything if the structures that we use are hierarchical and patriarchal and mm -hmm. which replicate the same patterns of burnout that have haunted activism for decades centuries even probably that we actually run groups where people learn good communication and are able to manage conflicts and run meetings that people enjoy being at and all of that stuff so when people do our transition training as a two-day training they might come on it thinking they're going to learn how to start a community energy company and print local currency mm -hmm. notes or something it's all about that it's all about how do we mm -hmm. work together uh, how do we do all of that stuff so i think that inner side of it is really important and so for some people doing transition is a kind of inner practice, a sort of personal growth practice. I want to talk to you about something that I think a lot about with climate change is the role of technology and, and big corporations in climate change. I don't know if you ever read, listen to Revisionist History, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast is fantastic, but he did one recently on detergents. And he talked about this detergent that Tide developed called Cold Water Clean. And it's an extraordinary technical accomplishment of a, a detergent that works just as well as a warm water detergent, but works in cold water, which it turns out that's where most of the energy is wasted or, or consumed is in the heating of the hot water for your laundry. But um, a lot of the activist people also have this alignment with being natural. And so this detergent hasn't been as popular. It's been out for more than 10 years, but this detergent hasn't been as popular, even though it's 
maybe the one of the very largest energy climate savings each of us could perform as an individual. I, I think that place where people's like natural, supposedly natural values collides with an important technology that might really affect climate change. Have you seen that yourself? What do, what do you think about these issues and the role of big companies who are trying to help with these solutions? We talked about the COVID vaccine mm -hmm. before. That's like, it's amazing. They developed a mm -hmm. vaccine in nine months. Yeah. And they figured out all of that an extraordinary international thing. But at the same time, they then used it to develop vaccines that are the intellectual property of those companies and took yeah. millions of pounds of public money to then create something which they then sell mm -hmm. and are making vast amounts of money. The, the amount mm -hmm. of kind of shock doctrine, opportunist capitalism mm -hmm. that we've seen during COVID has been terrifying. The transfer from poor to rich during this has just been hideous. Yeah, really so, it's, so, so there's one thing to look at the technologies themselves and then another thing to look at what they then enable. One of the chapters in the book was about the connection between imagination and social media and these very addictive devices that we carry around in our pockets. I was fascinated reading people like Shoshona Zuboff's The Rise of Surveillance Capitalism, which is one of the most <laughs> genuinely terrifying books I've ever read. The number of people now who are making, I think, very cogent arguments that actually on balance, if you look at the internet as being a 20-year mm -hmm. experiment, if knowing everything that we know now about its impacts on mental health, on democracy, on so many different things, really, if you knew all of that now, would we still do it? I don't know. I guess for me, the question about technologies is that we shouldn't just rush in and embrace everything because it's a new technology, but it should go through a series of kind of filters about who does it benefit? Uh, and some of those things, I guess we don't know until we've tried them out for a while. I'm not one of those people like Stuart Brand who tends to assume that all technological developments are great. And that if you question technology, you're some sort of caveman. But at the same time, I'm also not one of those people whose only natural things are good yeah. and anything man-made is terrible. But then we also, we have to balance it up. So electric cars are better than petrol cars. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. But they're still not great. We should still really be trying to design a world. It's not about alternative cars. It's about alternatives to people having a car. We need to keep in mind that technologies can often dazzle us from looking at what the real things that we need to do are. A huge amount of money now going into advertising electric cars. Not much money going into advertising car-free cities. There's not many yeah. adverts promoting public transport and cycling and walking. I want to ask you a little bit. You mentioned Kim Stanley Robinson. I'm a huge fan of his work. I think you're halfway through his ministry, The um, Future, yeah. and, and I read it when it came out. But I think this pushes a tiny bit more on that you know, corporate side, because one of the things he writes about in that book is imagining oil companies playing a decisive role in abating climate change. Like he has them drilling through the ice sheets to help suck the water out so that the ice sheets clamp down and stop moving across the uh, Antarctic. And that is really an optimistic mm. view, right? Not to see the oil companies <clears throat> as an opponent, but as the only organization on earth that knows how to make massive changes to our biosphere <laughs> and to enlist them. My perspective as a Buddhist is these people are our allies somehow. How do we transform the relationship and change the incentives. Um, what, do, what do you think of this optimistic idea that rather than blaming the oil companies for our problems, that you enlist them for their climate changing power to become an ally for climate solutions? I travel a lot on the Eurostar because I don't fly. Mm -hmm. So I travel to France on the Eurostar. And about three years ago at King's Cross and Brussels, they had big advertising campaigns on the digital screen things they have mm -hmm. and on the walls from BP, the oil company. Mm -hmm which had pictures of like wind turbines going round and they're saying, we, we run cars on food waste. And, it's, <laughs> and the tagline was, we see possibilities everywhere. And I took great exception at this because yeah. it's just not true. So I, I, every time I would pass through, I would tweet something, dear Eurostar at BP, mm. blah, 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 blah. And I did this quite a lot. And then I had exchanges with them where they would say they're doing very well and all this. And so I wrote a blog, I put all this stuff together. And then the guy at BP who was responsible for that mm. advertising campaign 
rang me up and said, oh, I just <laughs> oh, want to talk to you about this. You know, well, we feel at BP like we're doing really good things and we feel we should let people know about them. I said, I don't have an objection to you doing good things. That's great. Well done. But those adverts should have at the bottom of them uh, something like you have on packets of cigarettes. There should be a thing at the yeah. bottom that says 90% of BP's business is still extracting oil and gas. And then that's an honest thing. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess, you know, maybe you've got a point there. But I said, because genuinely, if you really did see possibilities everywhere, you would say we're going to stop oil and gas extraction within five years and we're going to become a renewable energy company. We're yeah. going to do the kind of things that you were talking about. But he said that's really difficult because of the pension funds. So they have massive investment from pension funds who mm. invest in them because that's where you can get a reliable 10% a year return yeah. on investment. Who are going to be the first oil and gas companies to really break ranks and to start doing that stuff? And you have to remember that there's still a company like Exxon are still actively funding disinformation about climate change and yeah. still giving huge amount of money to politicians to protect their interests and to lobby on their behalf. I I feel like a lot of what we hear from oil and gas companies is greenwash and that they are trying yeah. to present themselves as being part of the solution. Like you, I, I always like to give people the benefit of the doubt where I can. And, and I feel like if we were to find ways to, to invite them to play that role, mm then they could absolutely, I mean, they've got all the kit. I, I think it's a brilliant yeah. thing that, that Kim, <laughs> yeah. that in, in that book that he has that, yeah. yeah. We assume that things like oil and gas companies are kind of permanent somehow, or that somehow everybody who works with oil and gas companies are there because they believe in oil and gas companies. Mm -hmm. There was a really interesting survey a couple of weeks ago of people who work in North Sea oil and gas. 80% of them said they'd much rather work in the renewables sector mm. you know there's not many people who work in oil and gas who love oil and gas and yeah, for whom it's yeah. their great calling but yeah how could you create that transformation you know i think as spiritual practitioners i think one of the things we do realize is that there is no collective like it's all made of individuals the dalai lama says this all the time right because people ask him all the time how do you stop war and whenever i've heard him answer that question he always said make up with all the people you're angry with <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Your take is a bit more nuanced. You're not only saying, though, just work on a tiny local level, but that things start there. And you can have a vision as big as the whole world, but start where you are. Yeah. Like the story that I told you about Liège, that mm -hmm. started in Liège with a few people saying, let's try and reimagine the food system. Mm -hmm. And it's now spreading across Belgium. You know, it's a model which has the power to be deeply transformative, but it's not an idea that anybody sitting in government would ever have come up with. You know, it's a beautiful thing with the transition movement that we have transition initiatives in 50 countries, that when one place comes up with a good idea, it can just spread out through all of those mm -hmm. networks and be adopted. And as I said before about the internet, it's one of the things with the internet is that it makes this kind of movement possible and this kind of sharing of stories possible. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's, I love talking to you. I, we could really talk for a long time. Is there anything else though you'd want to add before we wrap up this conversation? There's a beautiful story in Shantideva's Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life. He tells a story about a grove of trees that make poisonous berries, mm -hmm. and that there are these peacocks that live in that grove who are able to eat this fruit and turn it into this incredibly beautiful plumage that they have. And I've always been really touched by that. You know, he uses it as a story to talk about how acting as a bodhisattva means that you can turn suffering into compassion and spiritual att attainment. For me, that I, I, I look at it as that's climate emergency mm. is the poison. But actually, if we can get our activism, then it means that we're able to turn it into incredibly transformative ways to connect people, ways to transform economies, ways to transform mental health. So that, that story is always really powerful to me. And the idea that as well, we need to be bringing the kind of joined up systems thinking, holistic thinking that is in Buddhism and different traditions as well to where we go from here. So it's not okay anymore just to say, 
we need a mental health strategy over here. We need a physical health strategy over here. We need a housing policy over here. You know, when we bring a good way of thinking to all of this stuff, it's all the same. Mm. Building homes for people that they can afford to live in and don't need to pay loads of money to heat is a mental health strategy. Urban agriculture is a way of ending the epidemic of loneliness mm. and giving people access to good food and building biodiversity and transforming what our cities look and feel mm. like and so on. So it's that kind of that sort of complexity systems mm. thinking we need to be bringing from the kind of Buddhist philosophy classes and into town planning and into mm. policy making and into activism and into how we think about what the future needs to be. That's very beautiful. Yeah. For people who want to get involved with your work, as a last question, where, where do we go? How do we sign up? Oh, so, <laughs> so have a look at transitionnetwork.org. If you're in the US, you could look at transitionus.org. Transition US okay. are, the, are the hub in America. They're amazing. If you want to find out more about what I do, then my website's robhopkins.net or the podcast that I do, which is called From What If to What Next, which every episode mm -hmm. takes a different what if question and explores it. You can find it all good podcast platforms, or you could even subscribe at patreon.com slash from what if to what next and join me and be part of that adventure. Thanks. I'm signing up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks a lot, Rob. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. My total pleasure. Likewise. Thank you.